Patrick Kennedy Alford Jr. was born November 28, 2002. His biological mother, Jennifer Rodriguez, lived in Staten Island where she would lose custody of Patrick and his two sisters for alleged neglect. At the age of seven, his mother was jailed for theft and he was placed in a foster home with his four-year-old sister, Jaylene, at the Spring Creek Development Building at 130 Vandalia Avenue in Brooklyn, New York. Patrick was struggling at the foster home, and his foster mom, Labrada, did not speak English very well, and Patrick did not speak Spanish. He had told her that he wanted to run away to be with his biological mother. She stated that he had attempted to run away multiple times and attacked his foster siblings and even threatened to harm himself. Three weeks after being in the foster home, he went missing. He was last seen at the foster home at approximately 9 p.m. on January 22, 2010. He was helping with household chores, and when he took the trash out, he never returned. His mother, Jennifer, reportedly knew the address of his foster home, and her aunt claimed she had threatened to take Patrick back. A few days after Patrick's disappearance, a judge ordered Jennifer to present her son at a family court hearing. She stated she didn't have him and didn't know where he was. She was jailed for a few days for contempt, but was then released when the City Administration for Children's Services determined she didn't have any connection with Patrick's disappearance. Patrick has still not been located, and Jennifer still maintains her innocence in his disappearance, stating she believed he ran away and is hiding somewhere. Various other members of Patrick's family, including people as far away as Maryland and Florida, have been investigated in his case. Several of Patrick's relatives have even accused each other of hiding him. In October 2010, Jennifer filed a federal lawsuit against New York City, the Administration for Children's Services, Patrick's foster mother, and the foster parents' apartment complex. She alleged that the ACS took Patrick from her custody without sufficient cause and that they were negligent when they placed him in an unfit foster home instead of with relatives such as his father. It is reported that he wasn't placed with his father because he was living in a homeless shelter that didn't allow children and he also had a domestic violence charge. A federal judge threw out the suit in March 2011, but ruled that Jennifer could sue individual caseworkers and St. Vincent Services, the child care agency in charge of Patrick's case. A wrongful death claim was added to Jennifer's initial damages suit on the third anniversary of Patrick's disappearance. She stated she filed the suit to get answers in her son's disappearance. The suit was eventually settled for $6 million in August of 2018. The money is being held by a corporate trustee and is to be used to aid in the search for Patrick and to benefit him if he is located alive. Patrick's father, Patrick Sr., was shot during a home invasion at his apartment in Brooklyn when five men broke into the apartment and fired five shots, hitting him in the head and the leg. He is now paralyzed on one side and lived in a nursing home for a period of time and still hopes his son will be found safe. His mother, Jennifer, has been researching and writing a book about her experience with the Administration for Children's Services. She reported in an interview that she was molested by a family friend when she was four years old, and that led to some of her mental health issues. She has kept all Patrick's belongings in her apartment, including the sheets he last slept on, his slippers, sneakers, game chair, and his yellow bike helmet. In 2010, the NYPD told PIX11 it had interviewed 14,000 people and entered 9,000 apartments in the quest to find Patrick. Registered sex offenders were also interviewed that lived in the community. Investigators believe Patrick may still be in the Brooklyn area, and if he is still alive, he would be 18 years old at the time of this video release. However, he still remains missing and the case unsolved. Corey Lynn Anderson was born April 4, 1972. In 2000, she met Ken Anderson and they would marry soon after. Corey had two daughters from a previous marriage and she would have a son a year later with Ken. In 2005, Corey and Ken separated when Corey discovered that Ken had never legally divorced his previous wife. 
She had told those close to her that Ken abused her when they were together, and despite being broken up, Ken continued to pursue her. She even had to go as far as to take out an order of protection against him after he placed a tracking device on her car. And in 2007, he was arrested for violating that order and was placed on probation. In 2008, Corey lived in Busty, New York on Wellman Road and had been separated from Ken for over two years. She continued to be a devoted mother and worked from home as a medical transcriptionist and part-time as a technical assistant at the Holtquist Library at Jamestown Community College. She was trying to move on past Ken and even had a new boyfriend. However, on October 28, 2008, Corey would vanish and would never be heard from again. She was last seen at the former Lake City Dodge on Washington Street in Jamestown, New York. She stopped there to visit her boyfriend, then left at 1.10 p.m. driving her dark blue 2005 Dodge Caravan. She would never show up for her scheduled meeting at 3.15 p.m. that day and also failed to pick up her son for school, which was both very uncharacteristic of her. Upon investigating her home, items were found that would suggest she had gone there after leaving the car dealership. Two days after she went missing, her van was found abandoned on a trail off Courtright Road, two miles from her home. Her purse was also missing and has not been found. It's described as an 8-inch black purse with a GH Bass & Company logo. Her cell phone has been turned off since she went missing and her keys are also missing. Corey's boyfriend was eliminated as a suspect in her disappearance. Prior to her disappearance, Corey sent an email to a relative. The email, a copy of which was provided to HuffPost, reads, in part, Things with Ken have not fully resolved and probably never will. I have come to the conclusion that he is psycho and thrives off trying to make others feel like they are insane. We finalized a visitation schedule in the middle of January, where by July 1st, he would have had a regular visitation schedule, meaning every other weekend and one night a week. But he left town two weeks after the schedule was all put in place. It was a gradual, unsupervised visitation schedule. He went to Alabama until June. I heard he got fired from another job, so he is back. He has not asked about visitation with Zach. The only thing he has taken court action on is the support. I would like to get the property all worked out and just move on as much as possible. I feel like he is dragging his feet with that because of a control issue. After she went missing, Ken married for the sixth time. In 2016, eight years after Corey vanished, he was arrested in Kentucky. He was charged with kidnapping, unlawful imprisonment, and first-degree rape after he allegedly took his new wife from New York to Richmond, Kentucky against her will. He sexually assaulted her and held her captive in a hotel room at a day's end, threatening to kill her if she tried to escape. She stated he had assaulted her before and that he had controlled nearly every part of her life. Many people believe that Ken is the prime suspect in Corey's disappearance. However, he has never been charged and as of today, the case remains unsolved. Nico Anthony Lisi was born March 11, 1993 and grew up in Addison in Hornell, New York. He was close to his family, athletic, but had a disobedient wild streak. Looking for a change and a breath of fresh air, he moved to Franklin, Tennessee to live with relatives his junior year of high school. He would get into trouble and spend a few days in juvenile detention and then return home to New York afterward. After returning home, he would be incarcerated on a burglary charge and then would be charged with statutory rape. He was allegedly involved with a 14-year-old girl and the two had an ongoing relationship that began when he was 17 and carried on until he was 18. However, days after being charged with statutory rape, he went missing. Police initially believed that he was a criminal on the run. The last time he was known to be seen alive was at his uncle's house in Addison. His uncle has reported that Nico and his friend Robert Knight, nicknamed Robbie, came to his house on September 30th, 2011 at 2 p.m. driving a gold GMC Canyon pickup. His uncle states that Robbie told him that the pickup truck was his grandfather's. They said they were heading to Buffalo, New York to spend time with friends and maybe go camping. One report states that the two said they were going to meet some girls they met on the internet. 
The next day on October 1st, Robbie suddenly appeared at his parents' house in Romulus, Michigan, an almost seven-hour drive from Addison. He told his family that Nico had dropped him off and stolen his phone. However, no one witnessed Nico actually dropping Robbie off in Michigan. Nico's grandmother was able to contact him on his cell phone around 5 p.m. that same day on October 1st. He hastily answered the phone and told her he was unable to talk right now, but he would call her back later. The next day, his phone pinged off a cell tower in Franklin, Tennessee, at or near a residence on Flintlock Drive at 4.08 p.m. This was the last signal from his cell phone. Two days later, on October 3rd, Nico's mother got his driver's license in the mail. Someone had found it on a street in Hornell, New York, about 15 minutes from his home and mailed it. His mother, who was already worried because she hadn't heard from him in several days, got even more concerned after receiving the license. In addition, Nico's Facebook page had been abruptly shut down without warning around that same time. His family then reported him missing a couple days later on October 5th, and the Michigan police would question Robbie on October 8th. While he was being questioned, the police decided to take him to the hospital for a psychiatric evaluation as he appeared to be having a mental breakdown. Robbie was released from the hospital the next day. At 8 p.m. on October 10th, he was found dead of a drug overdose at his parents' home. Four years after Nico disappeared, New York police traveled to Franklin, Tennessee to look for answers. After only a few days, New York police located the truck that Nico and Robbie had been traveling in the last time they were seen at Nico's uncle's house. The truck was uncovered in a private garage in Nashville, Tennessee at a property owned by a family in Franklin, and it was completely stripped down and disassembled. The truck was found at a friend's house that Nico went to school with while in Tennessee. The young man that lived there and one of his friends allegedly had stripped the truck down. It is unclear whether evidence was ever processed from the truck. It had originally been stolen from a man in Addison by Nico or Robbie or both. The Sylvan Park home where the truck was found was known at the time to have been rented out to tenants and was the location of frequent house parties for teens and young adults. The following people that are involved in Nico's life have since died. Robbie, Robbie's brother and father, Nico's high school friend that lived where the disassembled truck was found, and the friend that allegedly helped him disassemble the truck. Until the truck was found in 2016, New York was convinced Nico was on the run. Some people believe that Nico is still alive and hiding out. Some people believe he might have met with foul play once he arrived in Franklin, Tennessee. Nico's mother, Monica Button, does not believe that her son is alive, but without answers or some type of closure, she says she is left most days to try her best to suppress those feelings of hurt, anger, torture, and anxiety. Nico has been missing for 10 years, and as of today, this case remains unsolved. Kelly Sue Ackernight was born December 16, 1972, and grew up in Johnstown, New York, and graduated from Fonda High School in 1992. In 1999, she married Jason Ackernight, and they had a daughter that same year. In 2008, at the age of 36, Kelly Sue lived with her 8-year-old daughter Ashley, her husband Jason, and his parents at 330 West Main Street in Johnstown, New York. She worked at the Rite Aid in Amsterdam, New York as a supervisor, and her husband worked as a volunteer firefighter. On September 30, 2008, she and a co-worker locked up and walked out of the store together. She left work at 9.45 p.m. after getting into her dark green 1998 Saturn Aura. At 1.53 a.m. the next morning, a Johnstown police officer on routine patrol found her car in Frog Hollow, just off West Montgomery Street in Johnstown, just three blocks from her home. Strangely, it wasn't found on a route she would normally travel. The car was on fire when it was found, and it was completely destroyed. Neighbors had called the police about shots fired in that area at midnight. However, there was no sign of Kelly Sue and no evidence of human remains found in the vehicle. Authorities initially thought the vehicle fire was arson, but now they think it could have been an accident as the car had been having radiator problems. Her marriage was troubled when she disappeared, but her loved ones stated she would never have left without making arrangements for the care of her daughter. 
and her social security number hasn't had any activity. Her husband is not considered a suspect in her disappearance. However, many people have reported odd behavior by him after her disappearance, but he continues to maintain his innocence. Police have conducted many searches, including one with the help of a state police helicopter over a wooded area near her home. Police and forest rangers performed several foot searches with cadaver dogs, but found nothing. As of today, Kelly Sue has never been found, and this case remains unsolved. Jalik Rainwalker was born August 2, 1995, and nicknamed Jay. He was sadly born addicted to crack cocaine and alcohol and spent his early childhood in six different foster homes. He was even sexually assaulted as an infant. This led him to have violent temper tantrums and caused his four siblings to be afraid of him. One set of foster parents that he stayed with for a four-year period stated that his tantrums could last as long as an hour at a time. He also suffered from developmental issues, had a mild speech impediment, and was diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, but apparently was not treated with any medications or therapy. In 2007, at the age of 12, he had been living for five years with foster parents Jocelyn McDonald and Stephen Kerr in Greenwich, New York. Jay's foster family led a non-traditional lifestyle in rural Washington County, New York. They had no running water, they used outhouses for toileting, and the only electricity came from a generator that ran for several hours during the day and everyone slept in one room. The family stated they lived this way because it was better for the environment. On November 1, 2007, Jay and his foster father spent the night alone in his father's unoccupied home at 11 Hill Street in Greenwich, New York. He said when he woke up the next morning, he found a note Jay left behind that read, Dear everybody, I'm sorry for everything. I won't be a bother anymore. Goodbye, Jay. Stephen then reported him missing at 9 a.m. Jay is described as a very intelligent but very troubled child by his former foster parents, Jody and Larry Schoen. The Showens had originally planned to adopt him, but after he attacked their daughter when he was seven years old, they decided that he could no longer stay in their home, and he went to live with Stephen and Jocelyn, who had three biological sons and one adopted daughter, and would eventually adopt Jay as well. On October 23, 2007, Stephen called a crisis hotline and said that Jay was unmanageable and he had threatened to sexually assault a young boy in his homeschool group. His adoptive mother was afraid of him and no longer wanted him in her home, and his parents wanted to reverse the adoption. The crisis worker said it was not possible to reverse the adoption and suggested that they place him in temporary respite care instead. He was then sent to the home of Elaine and Tom Person, licensed foster parents who had provided respite care for him in the past. They kept him until November 1st, then returned him to Stephen, who planned to send him to another respite home the next day. That was the day Jay was reported missing. Within a few days, police denounced they thought he could have met with foul play, since it is unlikely that a child of that age could survive on his own. However, the possibilities that Jay ran away or committed suicide have not been ruled out either. Jocelyn took a polygraph test, but Stephen refused to take one. Both parents maintained their innocence in his case and stated they believed Jay simply ran away. They suggested that he might be living with an African-American family as he had always considered himself African-American rather than biracial and had wanted to live with other African-Americans. Elaine and Tom Person said that the farewell note Jay supposedly left on the night he vanished was not a goodbye note, but rather a letter he was assigned to write by his father for homework. Stephen allegedly told him to write a note apologizing to the people he had harmed, and Tom saw him writing it, although he didn't actually read it. The persons believe this was the note found after Jay vanished. Elaine, several of Jay's former foster parents, and his adoptive maternal grandparents have started a website publicizing Jay's disappearance. Elaine wrote she believed Stephen harmed Jay on the day he went missing and caused his disappearance. In January 2008, police named Stephen as a person of interest in his disappearance. They stated they had video surveillance camera footage of Stephen driving his van around Greenwich after midnight on the night of his disappearance when he claims to have been sleeping. Cell phone records also show that Stephen took a different route to the house than he had said he did. 
Later in January, an anonymous letter about the case was sent to several local media outlets. The letter read as follows. Jay did own a cat named Diamond, but the significance of the other statements is unclear. Authorities appealed to the letter writer to give more information, but the person was never heard from again and was never identified. Jay's adoptive maternal grandmother, Barbara Reilly, was very close to Jay and made many happy memories with him in the five years she had with him. She let him choose a four-day vacation when he turned 10, and he chose SeaWorld in Orlando, and the two flew to Florida and had a great time. She says that he was a bright and caring boy who was generally cheerful, though at times he would get quiet and moody when talking about his earliest memories. He enjoyed music, tarot cards, animals, and games. Barbara has been active in the search for him and filed for custody of him after his disappearance, but was denied. In July of 2008, she was charged with burglarizing the home where Jay was last seen looking for evidence. She stated that she saw the yellow fleece pullover that Jay was last seen wearing. Shortly after the burglary, police went to the home and removed the pullover. In a media interview, Barbara stated that Stephen had anger management issues and had been going to counseling for them and that her daughter Jocelyn had made him move out of the family home for brief periods twice in 2007 because of his angry behavior towards the children. Barbara said she witnessed an incident where Stephen became angry with Jay, dragged him outside, and repeatedly dunked him in a nearby creek. She said Jocelyn made Stephen write a letter of apology to Jay for this and made him do the child's chores for a month. His home was blocks from the Batten Keel, which feeds the Hudson River. Barbara believes that her son-in-law Stephen killed Jay. Authorities stated that they believe it is no longer a case of a missing child, but a case of a probable homicide. Four months after Jay went missing, his adopted family moved to Vermont. As of today, Jay has never been found and this case remains unsolved. <laughs>